and welcome to Security in Context. I am Anita Fuentes, and today I am joined by Jordi Bernal, Security in Context Media and Knowledge Production Intern, in what I'm sure will be a fascinating conversation with the award-winning anthropologist Nargis Bajoli. Uh, hi, Jordi. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here. Uh, so Nargis is an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies and co-author of the upcoming book, How Sanctions Work, Iran and the Impact of Economic Warfare, which we are very excited to talk about more in depth in a bit. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest. Hello, Nargis. It's a pleasure to have you here. Hi, it's so wonderful to be with you. So to start, I'd like to ask you uh, how, as an anthropologist, you came to write this book about economic sanctions. Uh, I'm curious specifically about how the study of sanctions can benefit from an anthropological perspective. Sure. So um, sanctions um, have typically been studied or been looked at by scholars of international relations, economists, and um, public health scholars um, for a bit as well. Um, and those have all been very valuable studies, but the reality is, is that sanctions, in addition to having impacts on the economic sort of sphere of life and on international relations and foreign policy, really um, the number one impact of sanctions is on the daily lives of ordinary people and impacted societies. Um, policymakers um, are very, have been very clear about that. The folks who uh, helped um, even um, in you know, create the apparatuses of sanctions throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century have also been quite clear that in order for, in their mind, sanctions to be effective, they have to um, impact uh, the citizens of the targeted country. But yet we don't actually have much research done on what it means to uh, live under uh, sanctions, especially long-term sanctions, and what are the implications for everyday life for the citizens in the impacted country. And so as an anthropologist, this was um, actually quite fertile terrain as far as uh, beginning to understand what do sanctions do to day-to-day -day lives of people. And that's something that we need to understand, especially as sanctions become um, a, a tool that's being used more and more in foreign policy. So our uh, next question is about the upcoming book you co-authored titled How Sanctions Work, Iran and the Impact of Economic Warfare. What are the main themes and debates covered in this book? Um, so we, um, I wrote the book with uh, Vadi Nast, uh, Javad Salihi Esfahani and Ali Baez, and we tackle a few themes in this book. Um, I look at the impact of sanctions on society. I look at it on um, the impact on the political uh, climate and political culture of the Iranian state. Um, Professor Vadi Nast looks at sanctions from the perspective of both uh, what it does to the regional policies of Iran, as well as what it means to U.S. foreign policy more broadly. Um, Adi Baez looks at sanctions from the perspective of, of the historical impact of uh, 40 years of sanctions, different forms of that sanctions on Iran. And Javad Salehi Esfahani, who is an uh, economist, looks at uh, the impact of sanctions um, in uh, on the economy of Iran. Um, it's not an edited volume. It is. It, it's it's a narrative that we all wrote together. Um, and we are one of the reasons that we decided to write it together was that we found that sanctions oftentimes, like I mentioned before, sort of focus in on one angle, but comprehensive sanctions, which is what Iran has been under for quite some years now, uh, really quite uh just like the name impact uh society comprehensively and so we wanted to provide a book and a case study and a narrative of what it looks like to target a society on multiple levels um and um and really uh, iran is the most sanctioned country in the world um, and has been for quite some time now. And um, we wanted to provide a book that is very readable. I think one of the things with sanctions also is that it's either something that those who are involved in the policymaking of it are keeping quite close tabs on, but the language of sanctions is written in such a vague way um, and, in, and, and oftentimes also a very complex way that it feels very difficult to decipher for folks who are not involved in the day-to-day -day of reading sanctions policy. And we wanted to, um, to take it sort of out of that and bring it into a language that 
um, intelligent readers all around the world could read and begin to understand because since it is a type of statecraft and foreign policy that is being used more and more around the world now, um, to keep it in such a vague language that feels a little um, um, uh, not tangible for all readers, um, I think is done on purpose in many ways because it actually then doesn't allow us to have the language to be able to question what this is. Whether you at the end of the questioning think sanctions are great, let's continue it, or whether at the end of the questioning you think we need to we need to um, sort of discuss this more, it doesn't matter. But right now the discussion is not even grounded in any kind of real understanding, um, except for again those who specialize in this field. So it, we really wanted to bring it out of that specialized field and uh, make it something that is more widely discussed. Yeah, I think this thing that you're mentioning about, you know, making this knowledge attainable for everybody is is key, you know, and uh, and that's also what we try to do in these interviews where it's like, you know, you, you, you talk to the authors because maybe somebody does not know what the book is about just by reading the description, but then you can hear the person who wrote it explain it like a normal person uh rather than more of an you know academic using using a more academic language and and it completely changes how you view the issue at stake right um the book focuses on iran which as you just said is the most sanctioned country in the world so in your view why is it important to to study sanctions from the perspective of impact at societies um because if we don't study it from the perspective of impacted societies, we only know half of the picture. And when we only know half of the picture, we're not able to make um, the best possible decisions about whether these kinds of policies, quote unquote, work. And one of the things actually in the first few pages of the book we get at is this question of do sanctions work is actually not even the best question, because of course they work. Um, you know, you're being sanctioned by the biggest economy in the world. Um, and so of course they work, right? It, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a question of scale in that sense. Um, however, um, it, it's about how they work. What is it that they are actually doing on the ground? And do they work like policymakers say they should work? And that's something that we actually, um, uh, that in the academic literature and the policymaking literature is not dealt with as robustly as it should be. Um, and it's precisely because we have not had as much studies looking at impacted societies. And so we wanted to try to start to even out that conversation because otherwise we're just having a one-way conversation and that's not allowing us to um, make the most robust decisions. So a recent report published by the Center for Economic Policy Research uh, discusses the ways in which sanctions are sometimes used as mechanisms to incite homegrown revolts. This is something we asked uh, the author, Francisco Rodriguez, about in our last interview. Uh, would you say sanctions against Iran influenced the 2022 protest? And do you believe uh, the sanctions targeted at Iran increased repression within the country? That's a wonderful question. Actually, one of the things that we look at is um, uh, this very question. In the case of Iran, um, outside of this book, I also do a lot of uh, research on the impacts of sanctions on mostly Cuba, but also Venezuela. So I've been looking at this sort of transnationally and over time, over uh, um, different spaces. And one of the things that um, we found and that we talk a lot about and write about in the book is that um, yes, sanctions increase frustration in society because people's daily lives become harder and harder as currencies begin to fall and things, you know, inflation increases at exponential rates. Um, and that has also resulted in um, protests for things like cost of living and, and, and all of that throughout these various societies and including Iran. However, the other thing that we have found in our research on Iran, as well as in other places, is that in this in the same parallel time in which society is becoming poorer through the implementation of sanctions, uh, the military apparatus of all of these countries becomes a wealthier because they're the ones in charge of sanctions busting, which we can talk about if you want. And B, um, they become more and more militarized because they see themselves as being under a, a form of warfare, economic warfare being one where economic warfare is not just about, or sanctions is not just about economic warfare, but 
But when you are sanctioning a society um, comprehensively like you are uh, with Iran or some of the other cases that I mentioned, um, there's also covert actions involved, cyber uh, attacks involved. So the, the, the government and, and military apparatuses of targeted societies um, uh, begin to respond um, to their own citizens, as well as uh, geopolitically in a very militarized fashion. So when we have uprisings like we did, we have been having in Iran, as well as Cuba last summer, for example, which had the largest uprising since the revolution and um, that when Castro came to power, the response from the state is increasingly militarized and therefore becomes more and more repressive. And as sanctions go on, the domestic sphere becomes more securitized. So what you have is, yes, uh, protest happening, but also an increased ability by the state to repress those very protests. And therefore, over time, um, society and citizens become weakened. We would also like to explore how sanctions force targeted countries to find alternatives to Western economy, finance and currency. How does the Iranian case help us understand the geopolitical consequences of sanctions, especially regarding the de-dollarization of trade of hydrocarbons? Do you see any parallels between the consequences of the sanctions targeting Russia after the invasion of Ukraine and the sanctions targeting Iran? This is a great question. I mean, so societies learn and pay attention from other, or I should say states learn and pay attention from other states that are being sanctioned. Um, in the Russian case, um, not only are have they been paying attention to what's been happening over time with Iran, but also they themselves got sanctioned in 2014, learned lessons, and then have been applying them in this current circumstance. What you have is that the increased um, uh, sort of knowledge from states around the world that there that the United States is using economic sanctions um, as a primary tool of, of not just uh, as an alternative to war, but in many ways as a form of confrontation. And so um, what we have been seeing since the increase of, of maximum pressure sanctions on Iran during the Trump administration, which have continued during the Biden administration, but then also now with the implementation of sanctions against Russia, what you see is more and more societies and states beginning to realize that they could do something that would not be in the ideal interest of the United States, for example, and then their economies could suffer quite severely as a result. And so there has been a push towards um, moving to trade that is away from the dollar by different states around the world. Uh, this is ultimately, and this is one of the things that we do discuss in the book when we look at the impact, because you know, the thing is, sanction, policymakers have often thought that, the, pol that sanctions is actually a quite useful tool to have because you're not uh, deploying militaries. You you don't seem to have a loss for your own your own sort of state. What you're doing is you're putting economic pressure on a state that's far away or even might be close to you, whether it's, for example, Cuba. However, the more and more that sanctions are being applied to bigger and bigger economies, the reality is, is that there is now a blowback effect of sanctions. And that blowback effect is that states are beginning to look at one another and their trade with each other and beginning to question, does it need to continue to happen in the dollar? Because if, it, if you, you can take the trade off of the dollar and begin to trade in local currencies, then it's um, uh, this is something that Iran, Iran, the Iranian state began to experiment with actually precisely in response to sanctions. They call it the resistance economy. And it's this idea that can you create an economy that actually uh, is shielded from the impacts of U.S. sanctions? And this is now something we, we are beginning to see other states developing. Um, and that's a, a, a serious thing that U.S. policymakers need to be considering. And to end, uh, is there anything else you would like to add uh, that we haven't covered about the book or your area of research? Um, I think, you know, one of the... The things that we also found in the book is that um, sanctions are often used, uh, you know, again, one, one phrase that's, that's used a lot is that they are an alternative to war. But two things that we that are part of our conclusion in this book is one, actually sanctions um, increase the potential for very real conflict between Iran and 
the United States and its neighbors, uh, especially when you look during the maximum pressure, the height of the max maximum pressure sanctions from the Trump administration. There were multiple times when there was a very real possibility of war um, in the region. Um, and so actually sanctions did not reduce the capacity of the Iranian state to um, to confront uh, those that it saw as as its enemies, but it actually increased um, the the possibility of further conflict. So that's one thing, and, and one thing that needs to be considered. And the other conclusion that we have is that um, sanctions are um, you know we have uh, regulations and laws in place for hot wars that, for example, civilians should not be targeted if they are not involved in combat and things like that. We do not have any form of regulations when it comes to sanctions. And, and the number one target of sanctions are ordinary people, which in just war is seen as being, um, it, that we have regulations in place where we should not be targeting ordinary citizens. Sanctions are actually constructed so that ordinary citizens are not collateral damage, but are the primary targets of uh, of the policy, because the idea is, is that you, you target the population enough, you make their lives difficult enough under economic contraction, so whereby they then rise up and either force their systems to change or rise up and sort of create some uh, an, an atmosphere in which a revolutionary or regime change potential is there. But what we see is, first of all, you are dealing with systems in which the states are, um, they're not democratic, so they don't care what the what the demands of their societies may be. And two, uh, as we talked about before, they actually have a very militarized and repressive response when, when their citizens do rise up. So one of the other things that we uh, conclude with in this book is that sanctions are a form of collective punishment and that we really need to begin to question and think about very clearly who our targets are in sanctions policy and whether they justify the types of things that we use to, to, to economically suffocate these societies. Because the reality is, is that none of the cases that we have looked at in that have been under comprehensive sanctions, uh, they have not panned out in successful ways. So then what is it that we're doing here? I think it's this is a, a main takeaway, right? That sanctions are actually targeted at ordinary people, and so it's great to to have uh, an upcoming book that's also thought of as a way for ordinary people to be able to understand the impact of of sanctions in, in countries like Iran. So, uh, Nargis Bajoli, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a very insightful conversation, and uh, we hope that we can keep collaborating in the future. Thanks so much for having me. It was wonderful to chat with you all.